Hello, welcome to the studio. Uh, today's video is about value uh, and also a few tips about how to approach a drawing or a painting uh, in ways that will hopefully get you better results right away. All right, let's roll the intro. <laughs> Okay, so let's ask a quick question. Uh, which is more important to you, value or color? Uh, and I'm asking that because a lot of artists will debate that point. Um, and uh, like some will say that uh, value is the most important and foundational aspect of painting overall. And others will uh, argue that um, uh, color is really where the power is. That's the place where you can more subtly and more dimensionally uh, bump the mood, um, affect that three dimension uh, a little more completely. Uh, you can affect the emotion, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the value folk might then respond by saying uh, that value is in color. And so if color has a value attached to it, which it does, uh, then uh, value wins the day. Uh, so it really depends on what you focus on and what your perspective is. The reason why I bring it up is because I personally think that they are intertwined and I don't much care which one is dominant. Uh, I just say study both. Um, the analogy I would use is, is picking up a musical instrument. Uh, let's say you don't know anything about music, you've never played anything before. You're going to spend some time learning the notes. Uh, you're going to spend time uh, playing and practicing scales. And then you're going to be merging those things into songs. So you're going to be graduating from the basics into creating uh, music. So I think painting and drawing and sculpting, for that matter, all of these artistic pursuits are very much the same. There are foundational skills that we can benefit from, but it's in combining them all and moving with them in concert that creates art. So we're going to be unpacking these things a lot more in depth in future uh, videos. Uh, so if you like the video, uh, please hit me up with a subscribe and a like and the bell and all that stuff. It really does help uh, uh, any of us to grow the channel. And uh, so that's very appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, today's video is going to be a charcoal drawing time lapse, focusing only on uh, just the initial foundation of value. And as I say, we're going to unpack that a little further uh, in other tutorials. Uh, but for today, we're just going to look at a basic value scale and a few approaches, as I say, to, to how to think about what you're about to try to do in art to make that value scale of use to you. So let's get at it. So the first thing that I do when I start a charcoal drawing is lay the paper down flat. Uh, and the reason is that I like to use a charcoal powder to create a solid midtone. Uh, and the problem with that is that the powder is very light and liberally floats on the air quite a bit. So you'll see as I throw it onto the paper here, just how fine and light it is. So it's important to be in a well ventilated area and also wear a dust mask. So even if you're doing it outside, I'd recommend wearing a dust mask uh, because you don't want to be breathing in dust particles from charcoal. That's not a good thing. Uh, so by spreading the powder around like this, um, I'm establishing the main shape in a midtone. So this forms the structure of the drawing. I'm just looking for the outline uh, with mass and a value attached to it. So here uh, you can see the finished drawing on the left and on the right you'll see the drawing is being created. Um, I thought you'd like to be able to see the, the finished drawing as I'm creating it because you can see all the decisions as they're happening in real time and have an idea of why I was making those decisions. Uh, now you'll notice that I've been using a blue shop towel to wipe off some of the charcoal powder and that allows me to negatively draw uh, the light part of the face and here I'm just erasing some of the charcoal powder. You can see it was falling like a waterfall down there. That's how light it is again. Uh, so, so yeah, I use the um, uh, the paper towel and now here I'm using a kneaded eraser um, to create a negative structure of that. And by negative I just mean I'm, I'm pulling out highlights, I'm removing charcoal to create the image. Uh, I use uh, kneaded erasers, uh, q-tips, smudging stumps, my fingers, 
pretty much anything that will allow me to remove the charcoal to varying degrees. And I always wear surgical gloves as well because I find they remove and, and, um, and they also blend the charcoal better than my bare hand does, but also uh, because I can switch them up. So if they get too dirty, I can keep it fresh. Uh, and if I didn't use them, I'd be cleaning my hands fairly often for that purpose. And, and that I just find that very distracting. So once I start in, I want to keep going until I'm done. I think that's probably just one of my own personal little quirks. But if that's of use to you, then great. Getting back to the, the concept of this video, uh, let's talk about the value itself. So I've noticed that with every one of my students, the value is confusing to them. Uh, so I try to simplify, and it was to me, so I try to simplify the whole affair by breaking down uh, everything into a, a bunch of bite-sized chunks. So I would take a base value chart, um, and it doesn't matter what that value chart is. Some uh, people uh, use different value scales to sort of reference. Um, I like to use a nine value range. So going from white to black itself um, is not all that confusing, but it's the shades of gray in between that are. So, so actually, let me throw up a value chart here for you. Um, now, as I say, I like the nine value chart and some people do expand that to 10 others, uh, actually limit it to seven or, or even less actually, but I like the nine because I can break it up into even chunks and that allows me to simplify it in my head. Um, so it's just trying to understand this value chart here that we're talking about. So going from one to nine there, it's really obvious, as I say, white to black, dead simple, but it's the transitions in between here that get confusing for people. It gets a little fuzzy. So if you maybe feel unsure when you're going from a value two to a value seven, for example, just how much black are you adding there or how much white are you adding to go from seven back to two? Uh, so it's a lot of guesswork involved for people. So and it was for me. So I break it down into the two main values, which are your white and your black. But then all, I add this third value, this number five for me, the absolute middle ground between black and white. Uh, the 50-50 mix of those two becomes a very pivotal value for me. It actually becomes the absolute pivot point, kind of like the elbow in your arm. So by using five moving up, I have three values in the lighter value range, and then I have three values in the darker value range heading to black. But five is the pivot point. So again, I like to take those three main values now as the structure for my concepts of value using this number five here as my pivot point. And that pivot point, as I say, I can just bounce back and forth from light to dark. So from five up, is a pivot point, but also five down is a pivot point. And the three values on either side are easier for me to figure out. Uh, the distance between those three values on the light side and the three values on the dark side are easier to figure out. So I hope that helps break things down a little bit for you in that regard. So if we take some of the information we're learning from that and we see this drawing that we're embarking on, we see that this is actually a fairly dark scale drawing. By that I mean that two thirds, a solid two thirds of this drawing are going to rest between these values here, the six, seven, and eight values. We certainly have black, uh, we have the absolute white and everything too, but the two thirds, the bulk of this drawing, the buffalo bonnet, the side of his face, and the shirt all in shadow are highly located in these three values. So we've told ourselves something very important about this drawing before we even start. Um, we can start in on this thing knowing that it's going to be a challenge. Uh, there, we're going to have a very, very tight value range to deal with. Um, you know, if we go from sunlight, like we have on the area I'm working on right there, to absolute black, that's a huge, huge value range. And although we do have that in this drawing uh, on a grander scale, as I say, two thirds of this drawing is now going to occupy itself in a much, much tighter value range. The distance between six, seven and eight is very tight. So we have to accomplish the formation of this young man's uh, muscles in his cheek and uh, the collarbone in his chest and neck area. And we have to accomplish the wrinkles in the shirt and the bump and the muscle of his shoulder 
in that shirt and the texture of the buffalo bonnet, all with three very tiny value switches. So that's a little bit of a, a challenge, uh, a much bigger challenge. Um, so dealing with the, the nine values for just a sec, just referencing that chart again, just for a second, um, you can see that quite quickly, that is just the base. Um, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that, oh, I only have nine values to deal with. That isn't the case at all. Um, you have nine base values to deal with if you use the chart that I'm using. Um, that is just the basic foundation. Uh, it gets exponential after that because you can start to play with mixing a couple or three values together, but it's how you're blending them together and the transitions you might go through between them that starts to get quite exponential. And so uh, a lot of ateliers or traditional uh, artist training schools, um, they will have you work on values only through drawings and uh, grayscale grisaille, otherwise known as grisaille paintings, um, for the first year, the full year. Some ateliers actually demand a two-year value uh, training before they'll let you go to color. So if you think I'm exaggerating the importance or the challenge of value, hopefully that lets you know that I'm not. It is a big deal. Uh, but even though I've just said all of that stuff, I'm hoping that that base uh, teardown of those nine values that we just went through will simplify it for you and make it more friendly. Uh, it certainly did for me. Uh, so getting back to the idea of understanding better what we're going to try to do in a drawing or or painting by analyzing our reference. So I would say that I can't stress the importance of that analysis enough. Um, so uh, if you imagine that we're detectives at a crime scene, we're being asked to solve a murder. Well, we've all seen cop shows. We've all heard of Sherlock Holmes. Um, being the kind of artist that learns to spot all the available clues allows you the best chance of solving that crime or executing that drawing or that painting to the best of your ability. So back to the analogy, if we're at that crime scene, we want to be the Sherlock Holmes in the room. We, we don't want to be one of the detectives that he regularly embarrasses because they miss all the clues. So whether you're working from life or from photos, and it, it does not matter in this regard, you need to learn to study what you're referencing. You need to understand what it is that you're about to try to capture. Uh, you need to see that whole crime scene from floor to ceiling, uh, wall to wall, and, and notice every object in that room. And that's how you'll be able to more deeply understand the challenge you're entering into. Uh, so in the case of this drawing that we're working on here, uh, that analysis told me right away how much of a challenge I was getting into. Because most of this drawing rests between that three main value range. Two-thirds of this drawing, as we've discussed. Uh, now, that's those values are extremely close to one another. Uh, so, as I said before, we're not going from that dramatic jump in those areas of the drawing from the light to dark. We're, we're dealing with really, really tight issues here. Um, so it's going back into discussing how are we going to create the muscle in the cheek and the, and the bump in the shoulder that causes the wrinkle that we can barely even see. <laughs> how do we create that sense of mass? and that sense of form with those really tight values. Well, that's what tells us what we're in for. That's how we know by studying the reference and we understand, oh, wow, this is a two-thirds uh, uh, issue here of very tight values. That's tough. That's really tough to do, um, especially because we have so much contrast in the other areas of the drawing. It offers up a little bit of danger for us. If we overemphasize the light areas, do we ruin the darker areas? Um, or make them seem flat by comparison. So, so you know, I knew I had my work cut out for me. Um, but that's actually what I love about it. Uh, I want to grow in my skills as an artist, so I have to challenge the skill level I'm currently at. That's the only way through. Uh, but that's also, for me, that's the adventure, and that's the thing that's the most exciting for me. Uh, so as a material, practical fact, uh, notice as the time lapse goes through, uh, how many times I redo the shirt area. So even though I had done my initial detective work, I didn't always trust my analysis. And this is another danger we have to watch out for as artists. I was also 
um, kind of overruling myself to a degree and thinking, ah, oh, it can't be quite that dark. I don't think I'm going to reach an eight in that area or a, you know, is it really my lightest light is a six in that area? I'm not so sure. I think I can go a little further. But honestly, uh, what that boils down to is that I just basically kept underestimating how dark those values really were and how deep those shadows really were. So once I finally embraced uh, the analysis that my detective work gave me, uh, then I was off to the races. And this really was quite, uh, it, was, it was sort of joy to draw. But it really took me trusting my eye and trusting what I was observing before I, I actually got there. So there were some pretty tough transitions uh, during this phase. You're, you're watching me do it right here. I'm playing with some of the highlights and just thinking, yeah, uh, this is not working. This doesn't feel like shadow to me. So, you know, I'll, I'll noodle around on this for a little while longer. And then eventually I go back in and redo the whole thing again. Um, so <laughs> once I got there, the drawing was joy itself, but, but getting there had moments of frustration. But mostly the frustration was because I did the detective work, but didn't trust it. So that's, that's the other issue. So you got to learn to do your detective work, but you also have to trust what you see. Um, so back to that detective analogy, being able to spot things is quite important. So scientific studies in the last number of years have shown uh, that the human eye is actually capable of seeing millions, if not billions, of bits of information that make up the entirety of our visual spectrum. Now, to prevent us uh, from being overwhelmed by that or, or being made to go insane, <laughs> probably from it, because uh, I think that would be a real danger, because uh, there would be a lot of overloading info that would just make our brain shut down, I think. So in order to stop that from happening, uh, our brain actually has a, a filter built right into it, an editor built into it that deletes most of that info from ever reaching uh, the reasoning portions of our brain. And the theory behind that is that it's tied to our fight or flight or hunter gatherer uh, instincts. And uh, those, those, uh, the need for us to be able to see a predator in, in amongst the trees, that sort of thing, for example. Um, so if you take that and, and really feel the importance of that, like our, our eyes work uh, beyond what we realize they're able to work at. That, that's their job. They're designed perfectly for what they do. But then the brain is designed to prevent that perfect working uh, item from overwhelming the rest of us. That's pretty cool. But here's the, here's the rub. Here's the weird part is us artists are that strange creature that is trying to do everything we can to limit that editor uh, so we can open up our visual range as much as we can. Um, so as we try to see uh, color more deeply or we're trying to uh, understand the relationship of objects in space more comprehensively, our editor does respond and it does open up and we do accomplish the goal of seeing more and we become stronger visual artists. But it's a, it, it's a long journey. It's a uh, in some ways, it's a slow burn. You really have to put in that work. You have to really study things much more deeply. But just know that as you do, it does work. It gives you the result. The editor does open up and you are able to discern more information. I've lost count of the number of workshops I've taught where I would point to a pine tree, for example, and tell people, like, see that little hit of burnt sienna bouncing into the shadows of that tree trunk area. And as I walk away, they'd look at each other and go, do you, do you see Sienna? I don't see Sienna. Uh, and then I heard one, one person say one time in a, in a workshop, well, no, it, I don't see it either. But if Doug sees it, it's there. So just go ahead and paint it. Um, but then, uh, you know, within a year or two, some of those students were coming back to me uh, and letting me know, hey, we see it. You know, by the way, look at the development of the drawing now in the video. You'll see how much darker I'm going with those values. And now it's starting to feel like an appropriate shadow. So that's the point where I trusted my analysis and, and trusted that Sherlock knew what he was talking about. So, yeah. Anyway, back to the idea of, um, of this whole editor concept and opening up our editor for our sake. Another example of that is you'll often hear people looking at art at an art show uh, and you'll hear things like, oh, gee, I, I never looked at a barn that way before. Or I didn't think it would be that beautiful. Or whoever knew a spoon could be so beautiful. Weird, isn't that something? Or, and so on and so on. So we help people see the world around them more deeply. And hopefully through that, we offer more of the world's beauty 
to those around us, but we can also move people to think about things, social issues, for example, more deeply as well. Uh, we can change a person's mind about something with just one image. Uh, we can provoke thought, we can provoke reactions in people. So it isn't just about presenting beauty, it's about presenting thought and perception as well. So through that constant attempt, uh, I guess, to expand our visual depth, uh, we, we become the Sherlock Holmes in our own analogy. But if we don't put that expanded awareness to use by studying that reference, uh, or in other words, uh, by applying the knowledge to the task at hand, we won't grow in our ability to accomplish a piece of art, at least not in the way we want it. So I really encourage you to take that extra time to study your scene uh, or your photo uh, and then draw or paint or sculpt with confidence because you already know what you need to do. That's the whole key. That's the whole thing in a nutshell for me. Um, if, we, if we just sort of skate through things in a superficial way, um, sort of improving our way through an image, uh, it won't always work. Uh, and, and there are schools of thought in that too, in the same way that an atelier would sort of demand that you, uh, you know, work on your values before you to color, go to color and then work on your color before you deal with the temperature of the color and so on. There are schools of thought about how art should be done in the first place. Some people devoutly believe that the only and truest way to create art is through an emotional reaction and by pushing the emotional value of yourself into that art. And other people believe that it's entirely an analytical mathematical process, that it's a, it's a structured technique of drawing uh, through understanding the relationships mathematically. It's a very analytical scientific thing actually. And other people believe that it should be entirely uh, driven by the intuition. Um, and, and I tend to be a fourth category. I think a lot of us tend to be a fourth category where I believe it's a merging of all three of those things that we need our intellect. We need our soul intuition, if you will, we need our emotional value. And it's in doing those things that we start to really realize where we're going. Um, with our art at the end of the day. What is it that we're trying to achieve? Uh, how are we going to achieve it? Uh, I think as a holistic pursuit, art is more comprehensively and more effectively done if you're employing every part of your humanity. So if you're using your analytical mind to work your way through an image, if you're using the emotional responsiveness to work through what this image means to you emotionally and therefore to the viewer emotionally. Um, and if you follow intuitive moments, little things that a, a stroke of a pencil or a smudge of charcoal will lead you down a different road than you had originally planned. Um, so you can be a little bit of an improver, a little bit of a planner, and a little bit of an emotional responder, all in that same act of creation you are bringing yourself more deeply into that piece and more deeply into the whole process of art overall. Uh, my personal starting point for any, and ending point for any piece of art, um, and this is just personal to me, and, and some people follow the same place and others don't, but I want everything I do to carry an emotional feeling. I want the viewer to feel something as a result of what I've done. Um, so I don't want it to just be an intellectual or visually beautiful thing. I want it to be an emotionally powerful thing. Uh, and so this drawing is an attempt to show a state of, of this person's being, uh, a moment of time in this person's life. Something, in my mind, some things may be alarming, this young man, but you may find it to be something different. That's the beauty of art. Let art be whatever it can be to you uh, and to myself and to whoever else wants to look at it. That's the power that we're stepping into. Okay, so uh, I wanted to let you know, for those of you who were curious about it, that I used a cold-pressed uh, watercolor paper for the drawing that I worked on. Um, you'll notice uh, as you work with charcoal or, or graphite, it doesn't really make a big difference. Uh, different papers react differently um, to the material. Uh, so some, some uh, papers will hold on to the charcoal really strongly and you'll hardly be able to erase any out. 
uh, and others won't really grab the darker passages quite as strong as you want. It, it rests on the surface and can be brittle and fall off a little too much. Um, so I find the cold pressed watercolor is, is just a nice balance for me. I can get a good amount of erasing done, but I can also get some pretty heavy darks in play. So I, I just like that paper. And also I want to clear up uh, before anybody messages me about it in the comments below. Uh, I didn't wear a mask during the, the drawing process. I didn't make it clear at the beginning and I apologize. Uh, I wear the dust mask when I'm using the charcoal powder itself. That's the big distinction for me. Once it's vertically up on the easel and it's, it's a little ways away from me, um, it's falling pretty much vertically. Anything that I do that's that's going to be manipulating that charcoal is just going to have it fall. I'm not really dealing with the light powdery stuff. All the real powdery stuff is already floated along for the most part. Um, and anything that's still there just falls kind of straight down. So I find I don't have to have the mask on. Uh, just the nature of my glasses, I, I can't seem to find a way to fit a mask on that doesn't fog everything up. So I, I try not to wear it during the drawing process. Uh, but if you have any sensitivities whatsoever, absolutely wear the mask throughout the whole drawing. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, so I just wanted to clear that one up in case you were kind of going, uh, I thought he said wear the mask. Hmm. Uh, now, I also don't want to give the idea uh, by presenting a chart and a whole bunch of technical information that, that the basis that I follow as an artist is really uh, strongly based in technique. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. It's just speaking from, from my heart and my practice, that isn't my through line. Uh, what I'm focused on is really the emotional value of a piece. So, so I use the technical knowledge, the value chart, the color charts, the scales, all these different things that we would talk about, uh, color mixing, all those different issues. Uh, I use those as a foundation of knowledge that I springboard from. Um, so I might be um, really focusing on thinking about the value range as a detective, like we talked earlier. But then once I'm actually painting or drawing, I'm really focusing on how to use that information in the back of my head, sort of more subliminally, so that I'm focusing on the mood and, and, uh, and I'm focusing on creating music out of the notes, if that makes sense. So I just wanted to point that as well. So if, if any of you are a little bit more sewn up like I am, sometimes uh, emotionally based people or, or like in my case, uh, I have dyslexia as well as an artistic bent. So I, send, I tend to get a little messed up by too much technical information. It sort of jumbles up in my head a little bit and actually ends up confusing me. Interestingly enough, I can understand the information practically speaking as I'm working, but I can get messed up by it if I think about it too much. And I've noticed there's there's other artists like me in that regard. So the, the technical side of artistic learning can sometimes uh, make, uh, make a mess of your head. So that was the point of today's video for me is just to create, uh, hopefully, for you, if you're like me, a little bit of a, an understanding of a technical thing, but in a more practical way. And I hope that that came across. So so that, so that instead of getting all locked up and tightened up uh, and, and God forbid, uh, legalistic or militaristic about the information going, I must only use nine values. No, no, no nothing like that. You can do whatever you want, whatever works for you. Uh, that is the success in art is what works for each individual anyway. So this is just a base of information for you to take if it's useful and modify if it's partially useful, but mostly not, or just ignore completely if you don't find it useful. So don't don't let yourself get polluted by anything along the way. It's just meant as a guide to help you and hopefully make it a little easier because um, if you are like me, that technical side of art can be a little bit of a buffalo running through a china shop and kind of <laughs> utterly lay waste to your gray matter. So uh, hopefully we've cleaned that up a little bit for you. Thank you very much for joining me. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Brushes in hand and ready to roll. All right, take care.